Hey folks, Matthew Weiss here, WeissAdvice.com and Weiss Advice here on YouTube. In this video, I want to clear up five common misconceptions about reverb. Why five? Because years and years of being on YouTube has programmed me to think in the number five. I don't know why, but it's going to be really, really good information anyway. Okay, reverb is a very complicated subject. There are a lot of different parameters that might sound like a foreign language. The different nuances of what to listen for can very easily get lost, especially on uh, people who are just getting accustomed to the mixing process. It's hard even for people who are really experienced. One of the most difficult things to get right in a mix is the sense of space. So it's no wonder that with the propagation of incomplete information that exists on the internet, that there are a lot of misconceptions about what reverb is and how it works. So I'm going to jump in here and I'm going to play a random sound. This is just a trombone stab. I'm going to use this to illustrate my points. So my first misconception that I want to clear up is kind of a necessary one in order to get into the other misconceptions, and that is that a gated reverb has to sound like an 80s sound. We typically associate gated reverbs with those big snare reverbs that just hard chop off. However, you can use a gate with a reverb in order to really control the sound. Uh, I'm going to show how we would do that. I have to set this a little differently, actually. I'm going to use this hold function here. This is going to be a gated reverb, and what it's going to do is we're going to hear the extent of the reverb tail that's printed into the trombone, and then we're going to hear it hard cut. We can even go a little further. Let's, let's hold on to it a little longer. So we hear it hard chop when it's in solo. However, in the context of a mix, we could smooth that out and just have it be kind of more like a light like reduction, so it's not like a hard chop. And what's going to happen is we're going to get the impression of this big, long reverb sound up front, but it's going to clear up later on when the ear is hearing different things. And so we end up getting a cleaner, clearer mix that still has the impression of a big reverb sound on a particular element. So gating reverbs can be a very useful technique based, kind of like EQ or compression, really no different than any of that, and just used for creating better separation and clarity within a mix. Okay, but for this, I want this sound to be drier because I want to show some examples here. So I'm going to get rid of this hold function completely. And let's get it so it's a little smoother. Yeah, something like this. So now we do hear some early reflections here from the reverb that was printed in, but I think it's still going to illustrate the points just fine going forward. Uh, we now have a much tighter, drier sound. Okay, so misconception number two is going to be that the style or setting of the reverb is going to be more indicative of the sound than the actual reverb itself. And what I mean by that is we might be doing a mix, maybe we're working on a vocal or whatever, and we think, oh, for this vocal, I think I would want a plate style reverb. That is a very non-descriptive way of thinking about reverb, and I think it's the way that most of us do it. In reality, the sound that we're going to hear is going to be the reverb itself. Deverb, for example, no matter how you set it, whether you set it to hall, church, plate, room, room two, whatever, it's always going to sound inherently like deverb, because the underpinning reverb itself is the algorithm, no matter how you set it. The settings like hall and church and plate are not how the reverb sounds, it's how the reverb acts. And so it's actually better to learn our tools and get used to the sound of the different reverbs that we have. So if we have, you know, Deverb or we have whatever stock DAW reverb, we get used to that sound. Maybe we have something like the Valhalla, we get used to that sound. We have maybe the um, Lex 480L, the Relab Lex 480L, we get used to that sound. They have specific sounds and we can make them act in different ways but it's going to be a lot more effective if we think, oh, this is going to need that Relab sound. That's going to work really well. It's got a really good, colorful modulation, but it stays really open. Perfect. That's what I need. Oh, uh, I need something that has a very heavy distune in the modulation, something that's going to be kind of creepy and weird, maybe even like haunting a little bit. Deverb's actually pretty good for that. You know, 
learning that sound is much more useful. And I'm going to show you an example here. So right now I've got two reverbs. One is a convolution reverb, which is kind of like the audio equivalent of a photograph. It's taking a snapshot of the sound of something. So this is taking a snapshot of the sound of an echo plate, which is an actual plate reverb. It's going to be a little bit more realistic to what an outboard plate would sound like. And then I've got D-verb set to plate, and they've been timed and leveled to be approximately the same in terms of their decay time and their overall volume. So I'm going to put on D-verb first. Now I'm going to switch to the echo plate. I don't believe that there's anything that I could do to really make that echo plate sound like D-verb or that or D-verb sound like that echo plate. Yeah, I could do some tone shift and weight it a lot more toward the low end with D-verb and it would sound a little bit tonally more balanced like the echo plate, but there's just so many different characteristics and qualities of the echo plate that are way different universe that I, they would never actually ever really sound the same. And this is why it's important to understand what your algorithm is doing. There is always going to be a quintessential difference between like an actual chamber and a Bercasti M7 algorithm that is in chamber mode. Number three, we need to time the pre-delay to the rhythm or tempo of the track. There is reason to time the pre-delay to the tempo of the track if we are specifically trying to create a certain kind of slapback effect, typically for vocals, that can be a cool way of doing it. However, pre-delay as a function is really designed to help with the front-to-back imaging and for clarity in terms of separating the initial sound from the reverb. So functionally speaking, pre-delay is not necessarily a rhythmic effect. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. So I'm going to give you an example here. Our tempo in this track is about is uh, 113 beats per minute, which means that our 16th note would be something like 140 milliseconds, something like that, ish. I'm gonna play what that sounds like. <laughs> That's kind of weird. I don't know if that would work in a record very well. I can guarantee that in the record that I'm working on right now, it definitely wouldn't because that rhythmic intention was never there. We don't have to put a rhythm into it. Instead, we can just think of pre-delay as being something used to control our sense of front-to-back imaging and our clarity of the attack of something, the transient of the dry sound. So here's zero pre-delay. <laughs> And the idea here is that zero pre-delay would create the sound of something being farther away. Maybe I want this to move a little bit closer. I don't have to create something where we're going to hear a noticeable time jump. I could move the pre-delay up to like 30 milliseconds and we might get a more convincing front to back image where the trombone would be a little bit closer to us. <laughs> And that is fine. That is the way pre-delay is actually intended. Number four, speaking of pre-delay, parameters mean the same thing across all reverbs. That's not true at all. When someone is designing a plugin or software or any piece of gear, it is up to the manufacturer's discretion what to label things and what those labels should functionally do. There are commonly assumed labels. Things like decay time generally mean the same thing. It means how long is the reverb going to last, and you'll find that to be I'm pretty sure universally true. I can't think of an exception there. But that doesn't mean that all of the different parameters are going to function equivalently if we're going from one reverb to another. And I'll give you a quick example here. I'm going to turn D-verb here to 100% wet, and I'm going to adjust the pre-delay. I'm going to turn it way, 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 way up. <laughs> What we hear is the reverb just coming 200 milliseconds later than what it should in playback, right? Now, I'm going to jump over to our verb. Same idea. It's a reverb here. I'm going to unbypass it. 
I have it set to 100% wet. I really want to make this very clear. The wet dry is set to 100% wet. Now I'm going to turn up the pre delay to like, I don't know, let's do like 140. <laughs> Notice we are getting two separate sounds. That's because in our verb, pre-delay does not mean a delay before the reverb acts. Pre-delay means a delay between the early reflections and the late reflections. The manufacturers decided that they were going to use a different definition of pre-delay than what you might expect. And this is actually the same way that pre-delay works in a lot of devices but it's also not the same way pre-delay works in a lot of devices. And this is going to be true for potentially any control. So you really shouldn't assume what any parameter is necessarily going to do. You should have a decent idea of what it's intended to do, but you need to listen to it for yourself in order to understand what it is doing. Just because it says pre-delay doesn't mean it's going to be the same thing. Okay, and lastly, number five, and this one is sort of a mind-blowing one, but it kind of goes back to that math idea that we talked about in the pre-delay. Decay time is not a universal constant, and I'm going to demonstrate that here. I've got a trombone hit that I've isolated, and it is at 51 sec 51.4 seconds. Now, I've turned my decay time on uh, D-verb here to 6 seconds, which means that our tail should roll off to about... 57 seconds and then some. So I've set a marker here at 57.25, okay? In theory, if this was six seconds, we should land about here when I play this back, right? Well, let's find out what happens. Not even close, and that was with a 200 millisecond pre-delay still on. So I'm going to take that off one more time. Remember, we're looking for this tail to end when our cursor passes this point right here. We're like three seconds early. There are going to be a lot of things that alter the perceived decay time and what the decay time technically means. Different manufacturers, because technically reverb really kind of goes on infinitely. It really stops at the point where the energy that's propagating in a room is not enough to even move the air molecules, which is going to be pretty far below where we can actually pick up sound. So there's different thresholds for where what defines a decay time. In top, on top of that, there's going to be certain types of dampings and things like that that can also affect decay times and so this is why having a mathematical sensibility when approaching reverb is an okay starting place and it's good to understand the framework of thinking about reverb in terms of rhythm and time however sitting with a pen and a pad or a calculator and trying to calculate what the actual decay time should be in order to occupy one measure is not going to necessarily produce the expected results. And that the better way of doing it is to simply turn your reverb up loud enough so that you can clearly hear it, time your reverb the way that you want it to be timed, turn the reverb back down to where it should sit in the mix, and then retime it slightly because now everything's a little quieter. All right, gonna wrap up there. I also wanna plug mixing with reverb. It is a 10 hour tutorial about reverb. Why so long? Because I wanted to cover everything. I wanted to talk about reverb from a creative musical angle, stuff that you as artists can just listen to and get ideas for and say, oh, okay, great. This is something creatively that I can use. But I also wanted to get into the technical underpinnings for the people who are more engineering oriented, who really want to understand the mechanisms that go behind how reverbs function, be able to parse out all of the very distinct nuanced details. So had to plug that there since we were talking about reverb today. Uh, let's wrap up. If you dig this video, hit that like button. If you want to catch more videos like this, hit subscribe with the bell notification so you get notified. If you have questions or you can identify some misconceptions about reverb on your own, I would love to hear that in the comment section below. And lastly, you know what we say here at Weiss Advice. We are musicians. Sound is our instrument. And I will catch you next time.